Yeah. Uh, we're live in three, two, one, go. We are live. Yes. Uh, great. So it's uh, it's my pleasure uh, to to introduce uh, the the keynote speaker of Mobile Soft, the the first keynote speaker uh, today, Carmela Troncoso. Uh, so Carmela is a assistant professor at uh, EPFL in Switzerland, where she leads the the Spring uh, Group, and uh, so. Most of you may not know her because she she's not uh, from our community, uh, but I am sure that uh, every one of you, or at least all the Europeans, uh, for sure, uh, know her work uh, because Carmela is um, the the person who has been leading uh, the, the the project uh, behind all the contact tracing uh, apps that were developed in uh, in Europe. And uh, so she, since she's uh, one of the uh, world experts in, uh, in privacy, uh, she uh, took care that uh, the, all these applications were uh, developed uh, according to, uh, in, in order to, um, to satisfy uh, the, the privacy requirement. Um, so it's, uh, it's my great pleasure um, to have her uh, as, a, as a keynote speaker and uh, she will be uh, talking about this experience regarding uh, the um, uh, the development of the, the contact tracing apps. So if you have questions uh, during the, the talk, please uh, use the chat. Um, we will just let uh, Carmela speak uh, and I may just uh, think of interrupting her in case of some clarification. Uh, otherwise, we will have uh, plenty of time at the end of her talk to um, to have questions and uh, and to have more discussion. So, uh, please, Carmela, the stage uh, is yours. Thank you, Ali, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to this keynote. Indeed, as Alessandra said, well, I'm not a software person, but I could tell you my story when actually dealing with mobile software and how it interacts in, in, in particular with what I do, which is privacy engineering. And I hope you're seeing my slides now. Yeah. I'm gonna do we can see your slide, all fine. Okay, so well, what I'm gonna talk about is about our experience uh, designing, developing, and deploying contact tracing apps, which uh, started by this thing that we were going to do for a month, a little bit like the pandemic. And it was kind of a sprint that then became a marathon. And by now, it's an Iron Man because here I am more than one year later, still working uh, at least half of my time on topics related to this uh, digital proximity tracing. And the story started in March last year, and here is just a, a, here a small overview of all of the things that we have done and how a lot of the work that we have done was not uh, at the design stage, but actually later on during maintenance and support to just make sure that as the apps get got developed, we were given support to the developers to ensure that all of the privacy mechanisms they, we had designed actually were put in practice. And the work I'm going to present here is, is not only mine, there were a big group of people behind uh, this titanic effort that ended up being these apps. And just a bit of context of why we came to this thing back in March 2020, when, when the pandemic started to kind of take off, um, manual tracing, which is this process that is uh, basic to, to combat pandemics, uh, was overwhelmed. In manual contact tracing, the idea is when somebody is an index case, somebody is positive for a disease that is contagious, talks with the doctor, and then the doctor asks them about their close contacts, and then those close contacts are contacted in order to tell them to isolate themselves, quarantine, so that the chains of infections are cut. But due to the speed of COVID-19 and to many times the lack of preparedness of countries, that this um, interview-based processing, which people would talk to a doctor and the doctors would call or contact traces, um, actually uh, very soon became overwhelmed. And then we didn't have a way of uh, catching these infections. So the idea that this, that we would have a digital complement to this process that could be able to actually tell users when they had been in contact with, with someone 
in a timely, that means very fast, and this is very important, especially for COVID-19, given the, 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 how fast it spreads, we need to cut uh, contact chains as soon as possible, efficient in the sense that we don't need so many uh, man labor and therefore could be faster and is scalable, meaning that even when we got to the number of cases that we got later on um, with the second wave, it would still work. And the proposal for this was to use an app. Because why an app? Because we mean everybody has phones, they are kind of widely deployed um, sensors, so that was a great idea. But when people talk about an app, in general, they dismiss the thing that we don't deploy an app. An app is just that this program is told on my phone. But to make anything work, we actually need a complete infrastructure. An infrastructure that would leverage phone sensors and that has the app. But we also needed to deal with network, with backends, a UI towards health workers, the UI towards people that would be the app. And that would create dependencies on the mobile operated systems, on cloud infrastructure. And all of this uh, is actually mostly privatized and comes from uh, the private sector because it's not that the health uh, system is very well digitalized or has their own infrastructure and even some governments don't have their own infrastructure across Europe. And it's why this change matters. Well, why should we, so should we start thinking about infrastructures and not only apps? Well, because infrastructures, digital infrastructures are a bit like roads, right? Once we set something up, it will stay. They're very hard to remove. Once you put the road, right, good luck to you in removing it like uh, one year later. It will just be there. People will use it. People will run on it. The same thing happens with the digital infrastructure. Once we create servers and data and communication path, people will find ways of continue using it and kind of expand it. And this is problematic because infrastructure is also hard to control. Once we have an infrastructure in place, you don't know how it is going to be used. And when uh, back in March 2020, we actually started saying, well, you know, this thing of collecting a lot of data from contact tracing may not be a very good idea. And people were like, oh, the privacy freaks already. So after that, we got plenty of examples how whether it could be the digital contact tracing or the manual contact tracing, you know, when you go to a bar and they ask you to put your name and your phone number, were used for different ways. The paper-based uh, contact tracing was used uh, by barmans to uh, stalk uh, people, particularly women. The, uh, those paper-based also were asked for by uh, law enforcement in Germany that wanted to have access to those to see who was at the bar producing the crime. And we also learned later on that both in Australia and Singapore, the data collected using the COVID-19 uh, app data was actually made available to uh, law enforcement to be used for things beyond the pandemic. So with this in mind, when we were told, well, you, you, we're going to design this thing, uh, me and my team, we started thinking about, OK, what are the constraints and what do we need to do so that this kind of future cannot be uh, cannot happen right and on the one hand of course we want to protect health related data because we're digitalizing doesn't mean that we're going to be uh, telling around our COVID status but also we want the infrastructure to just be used for one thing which is the, the, the COVID and avoid that is used for surveillance for manipulation for law enforcement or any other business and this is what we call the purpose limitation by default. Purpose limitations from those that uh, are um, familiar with the data protection uh, lingo is one of the principles that data protection imposes, which is that data is only used for one purpose, the purpose of the application. And typically, we get this by just signing contracts and having very big privacy policies that nobody reads. But because we were talking about putting a system on the pocket of every Swiss, of every European, and eventually of every person in the world, we didn't want to believe in this kind of privacy policy, I swear, um, um, that I will not misuse the data, but we wanted to make sure that the system was only useful by one thing, by design and by default. And what is the information that actually makes these systems repurposable? One is user's identity, who is involved, their location, because that says a lot about uh, their lives and what they do, and what, um, what interactions do they have, and also their behavior, mainly the social graph, 
who do they meet, how often, for how long, and all of those things that we know by now also, like for instance, given there's no the revelation, it's kind of metadata that actually law enforcement and surveillance is interested. So we wanted to buy to build something that could hide all of this. And of course, we also needed to preserve the security side, right? The system needs to prevent false alarms because we need to make sure that when a user receives a notification, actually they can uh, think that this is, is for real and they need to take action. And also to prevent denial of service in, to the extent possible, because if you have a system that uh, people cannot use it, then why would you put uh, an app in the phone of millions of users? And that was also very pretty and very nice. This could be actually this could be the introduction of one of my papers in the past, but it turns out that we were doing this for real. And then there comes another constraint that does not happen in papers, right? Because in papers, we don't need to deploy anything. So we don't need to, to in principle, kind of take care that things are super scalable and reliable, reliable to the point that we were going to put this thing to kind of help people mitigate a pandemic that was kind of uh, can, was, is, well, um, destroying the world. And we have to design all of this under time pressure. Think that every paper that you write takes you between six months and 1.5 years, right? Depending on the size of what you're building. But this time, uh, to be fair, the first time I arrived to a meeting talking about this, people told me that I, uh, the first app was gonna be in the app store in three weeks. No joke, three weeks. Uh, actually, in the end, from that point till the first app was in the app store was a month and a half. But this is already kind of the fastest time to market that you have ever seen. This is not agile, this is kind of it's beyond, right? Like the fact from inception of the system till deployment, and deployment I'm talking about the app being programmed on the phone with servers working in a reliable and scalable manner happened in, in this small amount of time. But from the security perspective, this meant that um, the design that we made, the protocols, the cryptography we used, had to be very simple. Why it needs to be simple? I mean, this is this is a, one of the first um, first security principles of the science called economy of mechanism. Also known as the KISS principle. Keep it simple, is stupid. Why does it need to be simple? Because we need to make sure that it works. And the only way we have to analyze things and to analyze a protocol very fast, if it is very uh, very simple. If it is complex, it has complex cryptography, it is extremely hard to develop the proofs in time for it to actually be developed with, with us giving warranties to anyone that this was actually going to protect their privacy. And that also meant that we need to avoid any kind of yeah fancy crypto or non-mainstream technologies that we could not trust, they could work actually under a lot of stress. That's for instance anonymous communication systems, you know, what happens if I over Tor suddenly to launch uh, 8 million Swiss? And that also meant that we needed to use existing infrastructure uh, that is on the phone. And the best thing at that point was decided that was the Bluetooth uh, low energy beacons that would actually do this job. But that meant also that we were constrained to, for instance, the size of the pilot of beacons that would actually constrain the kind of cryptography and fancy things we could do inside short amount. And the reliance of this existing infrastructure also meant that we had to depend a lot on the existing infrastructure, aka the phone and the OS manufacturers. So with all of this in mind, we had our first idea and we proposed a protocol, we wrote a white paper, it was published, very nice, but you know, it was actually not something that could happen because with reality and with this dependency, it came the fact that we had to rely on Google and Apple. And Google and Apple had to be involved. A lot of people ask, like, why? Believe me, I'm a privacy person. I'm not particularly happy to work with them. Um, but they had to be involved, first of all, because this application that works with this Bluetooth going uh, all the time needed to be done in such a way that you would uh, limit the battery and CPU usage, because other ones, users are not going to put it in there. Uh, and you are uh, software developers, if you're in this workshop, probably it's because you work on mobile, and you already know that the mobile uh, ecosystem and the mobile OS is very, very uh, optimized to save on battery. So we needed Google and Apple to be involved, to be able to change the firmware and ensure that all of this Bluetooth in the, in the background would actually be used in the best battery efficient way so that users would not hate the app. 
We also need this to run in the background. I mean, nobody wants to have their phone unblocked all the time. And that meant that Apple had to be involved because on Apple, you cannot uh, listen to uh, Bluetooth low energy beacons in the background. There was actually a privacy protection by Apple. So Apple needed to change their operative system to enable this kind of application. And also it turns out that even though both of them use Bluetooth low energy, the protocols are not exactly the same and the stacks were not exactly the same. And in our initial prototypes, we saw how uh, phones from the two um, iOS and, and Android would not listen well to each other. They would lose packets and stuff. So they actually needed to be involved to make sure that the two stacks were perfect and would always listen no matter who else is talking. And as a consequence of all of this, what also happened is that Google and Apple implemented the protocol inside their operative system. And also they decided what well, was going to be the API with which this protocol was going to be provided to the applications. And that has many implications. It has many implications on privacy engineering, and that's what I'm going to talk today. But it also had implications for epidemiology. What would be the epidemiological use uh, of, of these apps and what can we do with it? And it did also had implications for uh, interoperability that I don't have time to talk about this in the talk, but I'm happy to answer questions if you're curious about it. So what did they design? Well, what they design is um, something that the API, which is called exposure notification, creates every day a secret key called a temporary exposure key, EK. And from it, it derives uh, random identifiers that are called RPIs that are broadcast via Bluetooth. These RPIs are random identifiers that are used for a very limited amount of time to avoid that they become an identifier and you can be tracked based on this RPI that just changes often and off between uh, 10 and 15 minutes. And without the key, without knowing this TK, nobody can link two of these identifiers. There's a cryptographic warranty that they look random enough that you just don't know how to link this thing. Okay, so far so good. So with this, how the protocol works is that uh, a user, Alice, has uh, this key and then goes running around, assume that this is actually an RPI, and then other users also go around and their phones also go to it. And whenever users are close enough to each other, they will see each other's beacon and then they will record it in the background. And together with uh, the, the random identifier, they also record some information about the power, which they have heard this thing. And this power as a proxy for, um, for distance and because you know signals work like like voice if you're close you will hear me loud if you're um more far away then you will hear me uh, less loud and this is the same thing for the difference. eventually if alice has the bad luck of actually uh, contracting COVID, she will go to the doctor the doctor will give her an access code and with her access code she will be able to upload her temporary exposure keys of the period in which she was infectious to a backend server. And then uh, periodically, all of the users download all of the keys from all of the positive users that, uh, uh, that have been uploaded to this backend server. And then locally of the on the phone, they will compare to the lists. And um, if some of them uh, or enough of them have actually appeared in this list and uh, given the power, the, the phone concludes that the exposure was long enough and close enough. I'm also happy to discuss this on the on the on the queries uh, on the questions. Um, it will tell you well you have been positive and take action. Take action takes different shape depending on the country. In the case of Switzerland, it would ask the users to call a hotline in which they would receive more instructions. And this protocol has all of the properties that we want. The only information that ever leaves the phone are the T keys and only for positive users and only during their contagious period. And there is no identity, no location, and no information about others. Because these temporary exposure keys do not depend on the phone. They're just created at random. They uh, rotate the same as the, the RPIs uh, in a predefined schedule, not depending on the location. And you don't have any information about others because you only upload your keys, not anything that you have seen. And that means that this server here has no information available for abuse. It just has a bunch of random numbers that by themselves 
I mean, actually nothing, and unless it has already established a surveillance infrastructure by collecting RPI at that point, you know, you're already seeing seeing and everything, um, they would actually not have any extra information. And as an additional property, this system sunsets by design. And what we mean by that, it was also very important for us when we design something that is going to be put out there in the name of an emergency as the pandemic, that it does not become kind of a permanent infrastructure. Remember the, the metaphor I made before with the road. So what we created is a system in which um, the server has no information that is useful. This information kind of uh, um, and becomes useless by itself because you know uh, it gets deleted from phones and if users do not upload and they do not send the server the server is useful for nothing and that means that it is the citizens the ones that hold the power to sunset the system and we need don't need to trust any government to stop that we just need to trust that the systems are the side it is enough and then uh, we don't create something that is long lasting and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to just focus on this side, which is the side that kind of focuses on the phone, like one of these. Apps. And what does the app have to do for this and why that was hard? And what it was hard is because I have been talking all the time about this protocol and there were so many discussions about the protocol. But the protocol is a very small portion of the system. The protocol has to be implemented in a mobile OS, used by an app, integrated in a health system. It has to actually have a lot of information from epidemiologists, uh, be careful with, uh, with this uh, impact on society so that users adopt it, be law compliant, like there are a lot of constraints that we have to take into account. And there were a lot of um, quicks and funds on the way that I'm going to talk about. So the first one is the authorization. Authorization is crucial for security because we need to make sure that only the people that actually have positive scam upload to avoid that people just upload kind of keys and then others would have fake notifications and hate the system because you know it is lying to them all the time. And what we would like is that these uploads do not uh, leak anything from a privacy perspective for the users that upload and also that they are hard to delegate so that you cannot give them to other people and other people can upload malicious keys. And when we were designing this thing back in March, we were like, I mean, crypto for the win. We know how to do this thing. We're going to use a very particular kind of cryptography called commitments. And whenever I give you the, this access control, I'm going to commit to the content that you're going to upload in this out. It's going to be great because then you can only upload the keys that you have on your phone. But it turns out that in reality, this didn't happen. On the one side, because the health systems and, and everywhere it's very complex to actually integrate all of these to have your phone and the doctor create a protocol to talk to each other to do this kind of commitments and also because uh, exposure notification it may actually be very hard to do this kind of pre uh, removal of the keys in order to put them in this commitment because they uh, Google and Apple decided that there should be a pop-up to make sure that the users uh, are the ones requesting the keys. So applications cannot request the keys without the user consent. And believe me, I agree very much with that. But they made it as a native form. And that meant that this pop-up would appear when they decided in the uh, UX experience, creating a, a bit of a usability nightmare. But that means that you cannot request the keys first or kind of do this commitment first and then um, have the authorization later because the users would be uh, all very confused. As a result, we have and every country has a very simple activation code mechanism in which the doctors give you a 12 digit code. You put it on the phone and that is it. And different countries have different level of automatization in how these codes get to the users. And only Belgium implemented a very, very light version of the commitment scheme, but does not really do all of the things that we could have done um, if we could have unleashed all of the power of crypto. Okay, so are we done, right? Like we're done, we have all of the privacy engineering, we did all of this protocol, we designed it very carefully. Are we done? So the real thing is that no. Like, remember that one of the things I will requisite was to protect health information. And that included protecting which users were COVID positive. Nowadays, may not be so much of a, of a concern, you know, because now everybody knows like half of the people that have been COVID positive, 
And it's not anymore that COVID positive people are kind of pariahs. But back in March 2020, this was very sensitive. You know, if you were the first pe person, for instance, that brought COVID to your building or that brought COVID to your village and, and these kind of things. So we wanted to protect. But in the original system I described, it turns out that this network request to upload keys actually would reveal that the user is COVID positive. And when we wrote the white paper, we were like, yeah, man, this is so easy, right? We have been solving this problem in academia and all of our papers for like, like the next 15 years, the last 15 years I have been writing about using dummy uploads. And we had this, this, this very pretty line here, like this can be made by using dummy uploads. And then the next sentence just says, well, these are uploads that just upload, you know, uh, random values to the server and they are distinguishable from the real ones. Yeah, that was so easy when you write the paper, when you write the white paper, because you write that line and, you know, who is that, who's going to come to you and say it's not true. Now, in practice, this was not so easy. The first thing is that when we write these things in papers, we actually make an assumption about uh, what the user's behavior is and what are the typical upload times so that you can make sure that you adjust yourself. But who knows what is the user's behavior on a new app that is doing a new uh, functionality on a new world where people are in lockdowns. Like, how on earth would we know this thing? We didn't have any model. We didn't have any, any example to kind of create a model of this. Then we had the platform. The platform that, as we said before, right, um, is not controlled by us. It's controlled by Google and Apple. And we also have the fact that uh, the network um, is also constrained. There is a constraint on bandwidth. We cannot just flood the network, uh, both because the network would complain, but also because users would complain if we're just eating their data plan. There is also server capacity. There is a maximum amount of um, requests per hour that servers can, can get. Even though we have our server on a cloud, we're still not creating a server of the capability of Google. I'm creating something that is on the normal side. We have battery. Every time you uh, make a request, to go online, yeah, there is a lot of battery consumption that is a peak. And then we also have these uh, OS mandated user interactions like this pop up I talked about to you before that kind of interact a little bit with this user behavior and how users interact with the phone. And we need to have a way of mimicking all of this. And we have on top that we cannot use anonymity networks because of the reasons I said before, like back in March 2020, how could we even believe we didn't know that there was a too high risk? And also delays, which is the other way that we have to typically uh, get privacy uh, when we talk about the network, are not possible because the very um, first kind of functionality or handle requirement for that application was to be timely, was to help defeat um, uh, infection chains in the fastest way possible. So we cannot just be putting delays for uploads because that just defeats the purpose of the system. In the end, we created a system of, um, of uh, dummy traffic. You can, you can read about it uh, in the paper here at the bottom of the slide, um, in which we made sure that we actually had a schedule for dummies that would deal with the non-user behavior. And uh, we made sure that all of the uploads happen uh, with cost and time, they all have the same size. So we pad everything for everywhere. And I was, okay. So that was a little bit of a write compared to writing a paper, but we kind of got here. And this was great, it was great. Um, when we went to take our little um, protocol to practice and we talked with the developers, then we realized that, well, wait, because in practice, there is also this arrow here that also has to happen. There has to happen uh, authentication, right? Uh, users have to authenticate. And actually, authentication, how it works, is not that one, that you send this code actually to the server. In practice, how this works is a bit different. How it works is we have a second server, an authorization server, that generates this access code. The access code is given to the user. The user sends the access control to the authorization server that gives back a token, uh, a job token, and then this token is the one that is sent to our server with the keys. And that is the one that authorizes the upload. And all of these things is a little bit also for privacy so that uh, we have separated these tokens that are given here from these access control codes 
that are recorded and, and a bunch of other things. But this was the way of implementing this in a kind of an easy way that we could implement. As a result, what happens that dummies also must realize this authentication step. That means that both servers have to consider dummies, have to understand that there are access control that are dummies, that there are tokens that are dummies that would come with keys that they don't have to, to store. And while doing this, both servers have to also take into account that is timing and pass their operations even when they don't record things uh, on memory, even when they don't go to memory to actually find the correct token for you, they need to do still the same operations to ensure that traffic is always the same. And then there was a second surprise for us, which came again from the fact that Google and Apple gave us an API and they decided the API for themselves without considering what applications have to do and privacy engineering that came at the application level and not the protocol level. And one of the surprises was that in the first versions of this post notification in V1 uh, smaller than 1.5, they decided about one security mechanism, which is that the 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 exposure notification would only release the key for a day after it expires. And the idea of this was to avoid that this key could be released too early and then used to create fake exposures if somebody could actually uh, get, get hold of it before the user could continue using RPIs derived from this key. For what it's worth, this is not needed to do it like this. It was an implementation decision that kind of looked kind of okay and it was great, except that it actually interacts with the dummies. Because now, what do we do with the dummies? So we were thinking we can either, um, we can wait for this uh, other key, delay everything for one day so that we can upload it all at once. But that does not work, right? We needed to upload first all the keys that are available, and then the next day, we could upload the next day key. And as a result, what we have is something that is a little bit more complicated. So we have our dance for the authorization. We send the keys, the keys um, come back. Uh, we upload the keys and then the server gives a second token. And the second token is the one that has to be sent um, to the server. And you may say, yeah, well, you do the same thing. All of this was great, but all of this also has to be done in the background because that is happening in the background. And, and I have to say that phones in the background are not very reliable, in particular Apple phones. So every time that you have to insert one operation that happens in the background that needs to be scheduled and that you need to make sure that applications actually are gonna wake up to be able to do it, is a risk because many times apps do not wake up. And so for us having to introduce yet another um, and dummy request that had to happen in the background was kind of yet another risk that was put just yes, because, you know, mobile phone operators, they decide on the API, they decide on the background one you're going to have, and good luck to you if that actually works for your privacy mechanisms or not, because typically none of these privacy mechanisms are actually implemented by any app. What more things we have to do? Well, in all the presentation, I have presented all of these, and I have just plotted these two servers as here in this very pretty white slide. But in reality, servers don't ex exist in a pretty slide. Uh, the architecture of Swiss COVID, the Swiss app, it's kind of more similar to, to this one that I have here. And just for a mapping, this would be actually the uh, phone. This is the doctor that gives the access control. This is the authorization server, and this is the, and the key server. And there are all of these other things around. These other things are the things that you normally have on the cloud, the load balancers, uh, the firewalls. And it turns out that all of these devices that just come in the cloud for free, and I mean for free by default, and they cannot be really disconnected because they are necessary for, uh, for load balancing to make sure that the, that the cloud works. Because all of those come uh, in a package, they actually log a lot of information on itself because that's what they do. That's what firewalls do. That's what load balancers do. They load information so that they know what to do next. So that meant that uh, all the logging that we do at the key server, we had to think a lot about it. 
not because it's not anymore the login by itself it's about how um the logs that you have in this machine are going to interact with the logs that your cloud um and your cloud different modules are going to collect by themselves that you cannot change and are these two going to breach the privacy of the users how do they interact with all of these dummy requests how can we make sure we actually uh, redesigned this login strategy a number of times before we actually got to something that we can make sure that if there are some forensics study of uh, the swiss cloud and you look at the logs of this uh, cloud components and the logs of the Swiss COVID server, you would never be able to map keys to IPs and these kind of things. We also designed a bunch of uh, mechanisms to compute statistics in a privacy preserving way. And that's important for operational reasons because we needed to know a little more about uh, how many requests do we have? How many real users do we have? And we designed a bunch of those also to enable uh, our developers to not go completely blind when they deploy it. But all of this was also done with privacy in mind. And all of these also had to be redesigned a couple of times as the system was evolved. This mechanism, the, the, the exposure notification derived from our work in DP3T is by now implemented in all of these countries. Uh, it may be that now there are a bunch more new states in the United States. I haven't uploaded this graph in a while. And the green ones are uh, apps that not only are based on the Google and Apple Exposure Notification API, but also are um, based on the DP3T uh, SDK that contains a lot of the protections that I have been talking about today and helps people with this dummy traffic and with other things to make sure that when they use Gaian, they actually have all of the privacy protection that we designed uh, for our system here in Switzerland. And all of these, uh, well, by now we have around uh, a little bit less than 2 million users in, uh, in Switzerland. This is around 20% of the, of the population, which is um, 8 million here. It's a little bit more than that, around 25% of the eligible population to have a mobile phone. And more and more we're seeing how studies come out that show that uh, digital proximity tracing actually has an impact on the pandemic. It actually breaks um, and breaks infection chains, and in particular, it uh, it breaks them faster, which is one of the main goals. And even when the manual contact tracing is uh, overwhelmed, such as um, such as happened uh, in um, in the second wave still the digital contact tracing allows you to send all of these alarms and help people well, protect other people and even if it is in a smaller proportion than what was hoped in particular because the adoption by users uh, in no country went above 30 percent it is still a contribution and there is no <laughs> small contribution when it comes to to, to control this pandemic so the key lessons that we learned from this is that, well, data is not a must to build applications. You can actually think much better about what you need and then build something that has a wonderful functionality, like in this case, something that helps us in, to come out of the pandemic without any huge data collection or big data or prediction or anything like that. Privacy engineering goes well beyond crypto, the protocol was only the first small step, but we had to do a lot of things that actually have to do a lot with software development and how software actually runs on a mobile platform to make sure that actually what the protocol promised to users was really delivered by uh, the whole ecosystem of app and infrastructure and cloud. And we also learned that privacy engineering in an agile world or in a service world where Things change all the time, and you do not control the full stack, like we don't control the mobile operation, uh, operative system, is exhausting. The platforms and the requirements continuously change, and with that, you have to change the privacy mechanisms. And here is what I was saying, right, that, that we spend a lot of our time just supporting developers to make sure that every little change that they make to adjust the app is followed up by a change or we make uh, an analysis to ensure that all of these privacy mechanisms do not break. 
And the other thing that we learn is that uh, good socio-technical integration in society in the health system is key to succeed. And this is very hard. A lot of the problems of the app not only came from adoption, it also came from the fact that the health systems were not prepared for this kind of uh, very fast digital infrastructure. And a lot of delays came from the fact that doctors were not actually releasing access code on time, whether they didn't want to, whether they didn't have the good means to do it, and, and that um, makes it hard. But we also learned that actually people really like the fact that these things are private and that purpose limitation and abuse prevention needs to be a core part of, of anything that we design at high scale as these contract tracing apps. If we want even one person to install it, even though all the things I, uh, I have said today and all of the effort that we put, in Switzerland, the reason number three to know install the app is privacy. And I, I have more slides and I can tell you about our new adventure, but I wanted to stop here to see if we have questions. And um, uh, yes, so we can do a bit of. Yeah. Uh, OK, let me reopen also my. Uh, yeah, indeed, there are. Uh, so thanks a lot, Carmela, for your talk. Um, there are already a few questions, so mm -hmm. yeah, maybe we can already cover them and then we can go through uh, more slides uh, if we have time. So Antonio uh, is uh, asked, asked at the pretty much at the beginning of your talk, uh, and maybe this is something to clarify. Um, if you introduce some form of engagement uh, to convince people to use the app, because he said in Italy we have a similar app, uh, like with in Muni. Uh, that uh, was not really that successful because in the end there was low uh, citizen participation due to lack uh, of trust. So communication is everything. Yeah, uh, maybe I should have put this also here in the key lessons. Communication is everything, how the app is explained and it is, uh, and it is purported, right? I think that in key insight, um, well, first of all, let me say that I'm a computer science professor at the DPFL. I'm not the owner of the app, right? We just consult with the with the government and developers and help them uh, with the privacy part. But indeed, how governments kind of um, project these apps and how they explain it's so important, and not only towards uh, citizens to use it, but also towards the health workers that need to understand how this can become a help and not a hindrance, because there was so much doubts in the beginning that led to a lot of these uh, delays and problems so so indeed and and now we're about to move to the swiss COVID 2.0 uh, new functionalities that's what i say can talk about if we have time and we're actually uh, again helping the government create a better communication campaign and a better positioning of the app to try to increase usage and increase understanding of the, of its properties yeah and maybe if i can add uh, so before going to the other questions uh if i can add uh, regarding to what antonio asked i mean this was also kind of the the what what i've seen uh, so my experience was more in uh, in italy and in spain where i saw that uh spain kind of moved uh, well quite late uh in the process uh, Italy kind of seemed to have done a better job at um, deploying uh, Immuni. But in the end, even if at the beginning there were people installing the, the, the app, then something, um, something did not work as expected. And, and I have a feeling that in Italy the, the main uh, issue was uh, the, the health uh, system that was not ready to to actually use the uh, the system. So what I was reading on the news is that people were going to uh, to have the test, and then they they even had the the app installed. And then once they they were um, they were told that they were positive to COVID, then they were asked uh, they were asking for the code so that they could um, put it in the app, and then the uh, I mean, the, the people in the uh, the health um, care system were either not aware of that or they were not willing to give the code. So something in the organization kind of 
uh, did not work uh, as expected. And I have the feeling that while at the beginning people were kind of really hoping uh, a lot for, for the, the app to work, uh, then at the end they, they saw that something uh, was uh, was not working as expected uh, and uh, so they kind of lost uh, uh, trust. I think all of these are sides of the same coin in the sense of communication, as I said before, like many uh, health practitioners were not convinced of the app. It was not understood what the app could or could not do. Uh, it was not understood by users. Privacy properties also are very hard to understand. Like how people are gonna, how people are gonna believe that we can send to them a notification that they were close to someone without knowing who someone is. Yeah. Right? This is just a mind boggling. But with respect to the health services, yes, I mean there, there is both the technical side of how much effort had to be put to ensure that these doctors actually had an interface to click a button to create a code, but also to talk to them. And many were not convinced that this could work or not. But I think all of it really goes back to this to this communication and many times to the yeah, to the big technological circles that we like to have, that technology is gonna solve it all. But you know, technology can only help right. people. And if we don't have people working, then then it does not matter. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it's at least uh, nice to see that uh, it worked actually pretty well uh, in some countries, including uh, Switzerland. Um, so and Constantine has another question. He says, did you perform any user study to understand the usage model? What are the user uh, reviews? There was no, I mean, there were plenty of different uh, user studies. Um, um, I can give you links to work here by the University of Zurich. Uh, the Netherlands also made a lot of very nice surveys asking people why do they use the app, why not, what are their things. Um, if it is about how people interact with the app, I don't think that there are so many studies about this. But it's also because the app is the most silly app that you have ever seen, right? It does nothing. You just install it and, and it is just there. Actually, this is very funny, right? Because uh, a lot of people think and they have the perception that it's not working because they don't. Really and you're like, well, I mean, yeah, if you were not with somebody, like you shouldn't, right? The fact that there are no notifications does not mean the app is not working. It means that you're doing well. Um, but there were some of those things. Yeah, there are, there are some of these studies. I'm happy to provide references uh, and afterwards. Okay, great. Then, uh, so going in order, uh, Daniel is asking a more technical question. Did the variety of Android uh, versions and vendors supposed uh, to be a problem uh, to the deployment of the contact tracing API and apps? Or did Google backport the, the API uh, into old uh, devices? Oof, that's a very good question. Google backported quite back. Apple did a bit of a worse job at that, uh, which actually was a huge pain for us because it, it turns out that Google and Apple made a lot of decisions and did a lot of things, but you know who gets the fire, the people that put the app uh, out there, like the countries that put the app out there, and then you have Apple users being very annoyed because they cannot use the app because they have an old operative system and you're like, well, I mean, if Apple doesn't put it there, what can I do for you? Um, Google was a bit better at that, but still there were differences, especially with respect to manufacturers in the things as I was saying before, like uh, how different manufacturers and uh, versions uh, work with the background time of applications, that was a bit painful. And, and a, lit, a thing that made it also quite painful was the fact that we work without any feedback because these apps don't have Firebase, they don't have Analytics. They don't have any reports that come back to protect users, and that meant that we had to to learn a little bit from from people that write to the support line, and then you actually ask them to particularly give you a log if they can, and things like that. And and for some of these things, it was very hard to know where things were going wrong. Uh, I can tell you that uh, three months ago we had a big issue because. Uh, some Google versions actually went crazy and started using this dummy traffic. Uh, we saw a peak of, I don't know, 30 million users. Right? I told you there are 80 million people in 
in Switzerland. And uh, we didn't know why or how, and it just uh, worked. I mean, eventually there was a bug and eventually disappeared and Google and Apple did that. But we never knew which version was it or why. Interesting. Uh, okay, more questions. Um, so, Konstantin uh, again is asking, what are the attack vendors? The attack vendors? Yeah. Maybe, Constantin, can you, can you clarify the question? Because I am not sure I understand it. Maybe the, the, the possible attack vendors to to, to the protocol? Uh, like what kind of like act up, uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, ve vectors, did, what do that ah. mean? <laughs> Sorry. So what are the- Scenarios, attacks? yeah, the scenarios of attacks. Okay, that's- um, The scenarios of attacks, uh, I mean, they, you have at the protocol level, what kind of things can happen there, there is there is the possibility of relay attacks like if you hear beacons from one phone and you can use those to rely to other phones you can have amplification attacks in which you have big antennas that you use to, to send the same beacon uh, to many people and those are the kind of things that can result on fake notifications on the other side, you have the privacy type of attacks in which uh, in order to, to threaten privacy, what you need is an adversary that can listen to a lot of this beacon and giving them a location. And that you can have by having people deploying infrastructure on around the place, or you can have apps installed on the phone that may also um, may also record these beacons, and if those apps have access to the location, may send it back home. For this second one, we actually uh, looked a little bit at the study of, if you're an app and you want to do that, what can you learn? And if you really want to learn things, you need to listen to the Bluetooth a lot, which would actually create a huge uh, battery squeeze. So we don't really believe that users could uh, be um, that you can do these attacks in a stealthy way. Because if you want to collect a lot of data from the phone, the user will realize that there is an app that is eating all of the battery and probably uninstalled it. But we have no evidence that any of these things have happened or not happened. Okay. So Antonio was, uh, yeah, just just uh, speaking, I mean, he's um, saying his opinion uh, regarding to the to the first question that he asked. He says, the synergy between these apps and the health digital system is, in my opinion, uh, something mandatory. They cannot be detached. Uh, the communication of the positive status should be something that the health system must manage and not the single citizen uh, in yes, but the problem of all of this is how do you do it? And mm -hmm. how do you do it in a month? Mm -hmm. Okay, because again, let, 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 let's, let's uh, like in hindsight, like there's a lot of things that we can do and that nowadays we do better right nowadays, for instance, actually nowadays the, the delivery of codes in Switzerland is much more automatized. There's a lot of machine to machine uh, conversations so that these codes are delivered to the user without so much intervention of the cantonal doctor which uh, makes it much smoother and they get faster. Now, this took us like eight months to make, be able to actually make it happen. Also, because for that, you need to also take into account a lot of laws of which service is allowed to actually know the positive of which, which server, to know the positive status of a user, to send an indication to another server that actually can set an access code. So while well, we all agree on this and we all learned a lot, uh, some of those things are just very easy to say, or, or to me, right? It's very easy to think about many of these things when I write them on papers. Nowadays, I have learned a lot about how hard it is, especially when you need to connect, like in Switzerland or Spain, the health systems of all the cantons or regions which are independent, all together to a huge database and to an only one huge server. So I, I agree on all of this, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Next time it's going to be much better. <laughs> Hopefully there will there there won't be another next time at least for for COVID. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm sure that uh, 
um, this kind of protocol def definitely has um, potential applications for uh, for other situations uh, beside the uh, pandemic. Um, so there is another question from uh, Danielle um, regarding what you were saying. Uh, you were talking about Crashlytic and he uh, he's uh, saying, I heard rumors uh, that the Spanish uh, version uh, had Firebase uh, in the application, uh, but it's, I mean, it's not sure whether it was a bad uh, uh, pull request uh, or, or what happened uh, exactly in there. And maybe here it's, it's a good uh, time to, to discuss, I think, one of the main differences between our community. So in, in software engineering, at least I, uh, I probably don't see uh, these kind of libraries uh, ne necessarily as bad as you see uh, them, just because in the software engineering um, uh, research community, we, we tend to develop a lot of these uh, tools, like to, to track uh, how the user uh, interacts with, uh, uh, with the, the application uh, so that you can actually provide some information to the developer. Uh, so I see the good side of libraries like Crashlytic because obviously you, you can provide some feedback to the developers, but obviously, obviously you see the other side of the coin uh, that is the, the, the potential privacy uh, issues uh, that you can have with uh, uh, with these libraries. Um, so yeah, maybe starting from what uh, Danielle was uh, asking specifically about uh, Firebase in the Spanish version of the app, and then if you feel like saying something uh, more so we do we do know that the that the Spanish app had Firebase in the first version, the version that was used to do the pilot, but we could never know what was it used for because, as you know, the app was obfuscated, and then they changed the server and they pinned the certificate, and it's just not possible to go back in time and know what on earth they were collecting from the app, and uh, we will never know. What can I say? Uh, if one of you wants to work on the obfuscate in the app and finding out, I'm all happy to work with you on this. Uh, about the, the libraries, indeed, I mean, it is true that all of these tools are very useful. But as many of the things that I was saying before, when you take out of the box things and you put them in a privacy preserving system, the thing is that we are kind of also, it's impossible to do privacy engineering with them. Right. We could not because we could, if now we would be talking for a while and we were thinking about what can, what is the kind of information that I actually need to provide and what's the minimum amount of information from each of the crash, maybe we can create actually a privacy preserving version of this library that we could actually implement now here on, on, this, on these apps so that we can collect more data and give more feedback to the developers. But the problem is that in an agile services world, I cannot do this because the service that they have is Crash Analytics that comes into Firebase. The moment that they put Firebase on my uh, on my app, I not only put Firebase, I make Crash Analytics. I put a lot of crap from Google that I don't, that I can't get to the mind, that it will change on the fly whenever they want, however they want to take whatever they want, right? So it, they, it comes with a lot of things that we could not afford to have in an app in which we're promising the user that there is no way on earth and that, that is the main thing that it is nowhere on earth any data is going to leave anywhere and when i put firebase on my app i have no idea about what google play services is sending me to google. yeah okay well i mean this um i believe this was a great uh session and uh, a very 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 good uh keynote so we we have just one minute before uh we get kicked out of uh of this event so i would really like to take this time to to thank you once again uh carmela and uh and just to to tell all the attendees uh that uh, we will now have a 15 minute uh break so you can go uh so you see all the people all the clapping <laughs> um so it means a lot of people really a lot of people appreciated uh your your talk um so as i was saying uh we have a 15 minutes um, time for a break. We have one room that is called Mobile Soft Break. 
uh, where we, I mean, whoever wants to uh, have a bit of social event uh, can go there and everybody can actually uh, be uh, live with the video and uh, the microphone. So it's uh, nicer to, to interact. And then after that, we will start with the empirical studies and uh, software modeling um, uh, session with the papers. So thanks a lot, Carmela. It was really great uh, to have you here, even if uh, unfortunately just uh, virtually. Thank you guys for the invitation. It's really great to interact with other communities. And